All right, it's Mike. Thanks for tuning back in. It is Attic Find Friday. Before I get started on what is, in my opinion, the best Attic Find story in uh, at least a month, maybe, um, this weekend, tomorrow, I'm on Hobby Hotline on Bench Clear Media at 11 a.m. That is a live show. I will be saying a lot of stupid things live, so come and heckle me in the comments. Um, this weekend, I've got I've got some weird stuff coming out. I have bought some unusual nostalgia-based collectibles. So click subscribe if you're new here. Make sure you see the new stuff I've got coming out that are, uh, you know, I'm still doing very regular baseball card, sports card content. But I'm also going to dabble in some nostalgia-based collectibles. So, yes. Looking forward to it. Uh, so this is a, uh, a the Bible study find, I call it, and I think Forbes called it this as well. A lot of this comes from Forbes, unusually. Uh, so they called it, a lot of people were calling it the Texas find. Uh, I, we got to come up with better names for, for these finds. You can't just call it the Texas find. What if somebody else has a big find in Texas? Are you going to call it the Texas find too? No, this one is the Bible study find. Uh, this happened in 2016 when two people, a, a widow and another Bible study person, were talking about their husband's interest. And the widow, of course, is talking about her husband who had passed away almost a decade before, and she said that he was really into sports cards. And the other woman said, oh, my husband's really into sports cards. And uh, her, the husband who's still alive, was also somebody prominent, although anonymous to this story, in the collecting community. And uh, I really want to know who it was. Like, was this Mike Moynihan? It's Texas? Uh, I don't know. Could be. So um, this person, the, the husband, uh, goes over and looks at the collection and is like, wow, this is amazing. It's huge. So they call an acquaintance of theirs who is named Al Crisafuli, I think is how you pronounce it, out of New Jersey, who runs... Uh, an, an auction house in New Jersey. I think it's called For the Love of the Game. Uh, I hope I've got that right. I didn't take a note on that for some reason. And says, hey, this this widow has her husband's collection. You might be interested in this. It's a pretty big deal. And they, they over the several phone calls between Chris Afuli and the family of the deceased, he they talk about how he her husband... Charlie, Charlie Young. So this one is not anonymous, so it's a much more believable story than some of the others. Charlie Young had collected from 1948 until his death in 2007. So almost 60 years of collecting. He passed away at 67. He started collecting when he was eight in 1948. And he amassed just about every mainstream card that was produced between 1948 and 2007. It is a massive horde of baseball cards. Baseball cards almost exclusively, although there were some hockey and some other things. And not only uh, major league sets, but a lot of 1980s minor league sets too. We'll talk very briefly about those, just because I love 80s minor league sets of Hall of Famers. Um, so this one is not some you know, multi-million dollar horde of cards. There were no six-figure cards in this collection. But, and we'll get into values and, and the amounts that things sold for. But Charlie Young, as I said, died at age 67 in 2007. He was an accountant. He brought, helped bring minor league baseball team into his town in the 1970s. He, was, he loved baseball, went to church every Sunday. Uh, that's where his wife ended up spreading the news of the story to somebody else and how it got out. But nobody ever knew about his collection until a decade after he passed never bought a single card on eBay, never went to card shops, had never graded a single card in his life. Of course, 2007 grading wasn't as prominent yet as it is today, but it was still a pretty big deal. There were many grading companies out by 2007, didn't have a single graded card, had never talked on a forum about his collection before, I kept it completely private. It was all in one room in his house. So after speaking with the family, Al Crisafuli ends up hopping in his SUV for the 26-hour drive from New Jersey to Texas 
to see what the car... He doesn't know what's in this collection. So he gets there, and they escort him into the room, and he is blown away by what he sees. It's just shelf after shelf of binders and binders and binders and boxes. It's basically every set collector's dream. It is the completest collector's dream. Like I said, he's got every card from 48 until 2007. Literally nobody knew. Even his family didn't know what he had. Uh, Chris Afuli walks in and he's, he knows, I think immediately, that he's going to need more than his SUV. So he collects, he collects what he can. Uh, and he's looking through them. He's got uh, 1948 through 1980 binders are all in photo albums, and the cards are inserted into photo corners. Uh, I've got some of these. So I insert cards for TTM in photo corners. I put the cards in these things, and he was putting them in photo corners and photo albums with a a photo corner on all four corners. You can see it in this image here. And so from 1948 until 1980, all of them were like that. And then in 1981, he started getting binders with plastic sheets like we're familiar with today. So he started collecting in 48, like I said. He was buying cards in packs and opening the packs, eating the gum, of course. And then he would organize them. He had it very well organized. And uh, he would buy to complete his sets. Sometimes he wouldn't be able to complete them via packs. He would go, um, he would either go to a card show where he would try to f- buy cards to complete his sets, or he would find in hobby publications ads for you know, singles for sets, and he would buy them through the mail that way. He did have years of Beckett price guides, Beckett baseball card price guides, stored in this room, but there's no other evidence that he ever considered value. Now, he did want very centered cards. All of his cards were very well centered, noteworthy, how centered they were. So maybe he did consider value or maybe it was just eye appeal. Maybe he was just reading the articles, right? There were hundreds of binders and photo albums and boxes in this one room. Chris Afuli spent eight hours in that room cataloging everything he saw and and came across. He drove home with a full car. He was so anxious to see what the condition of the, the 1950s cards were as soon as he got home, he pulled out the photo albums. He had a broken steak knife that had the broken had a broken tip on it, and he used that to very carefully get the photo corners off and take the cards out, and found that they were in very, very good shape, mid to high condition grades. He started with the 59 tops. You can see here the Mickey Mantle. It looks pretty darn good. For his next trip down, Chris Foley rented a cargo van, knowing that his SUV wasn't going to be enough, took the, drove back, all the way back 26 hours again, found that one of the boxes was a 1959 filled with loose duplicates, including the mantle, by the way. Um, So he wondered how many duplicates were there. There were a lot, because you're opening up packs. Like, I I open up a lot of uh, 2022 Tops Series 1. I had a lot of duplicates. So he found... This is one of the best parts. 485 1952 Tops duplicates. 485. He had the complete set from 1952 Tops, but then he had 485 dupes. So here are the things that that this Charlie Young had in the collection that was consigned to love of the game, auctions, He had the only signed 1952 Tops Frank Campos with a black star on the back. I wasn't even aware of this card. I did a little research on it. It's pretty interesting. So 1952 Tops, you had the red stars on each side on the back of the card. And the Frank Campos, there was a printing error of some sort. And uh, hundreds of them got out with one red star, one black star. And at some point, PSA agreed, yeah, this is, a, this is an interesting error. And they added it. And they, there are about 100 that have been graded by PSA at this point. So it's very rare. And this is the only signed one known to exist. So the Campos, uh, it ended up selling for $5,000 on Love of the Game auctions. This was in the spring 2016 premiere 
auctions at Love of the Game. Uh, so it was sometime in 2015, 16, I guess, that this was discovered by Chris Afuli. So if you're, if you're interested in the non-signed Campos card, 1952, with the black uh, star, PSA 5 sold last year, 2022, for about $2,500. PSA 8 sold in 2010 for $25,000. Now, the PSA 8 sold again, I think, like 2018 for $9,000. So come down a lot, probably a lot more grades on it since then, but still interesting. Uh, a PSA 3.5 1952 mantle sold for $24,000. Pretty good. The entire 1958 Hires root beer set sold for $2,300. This is a really cool set. <laughs> Interestingly, this is the lowest value one, but uh, the 1982 TCMA John Elway card where he was he had signed with the Yankees sold for a couple hundred bucks. It was in a Beckett, 200, a Beckett 8 slab. The 1952 set minus that mantle sold for $14,000. The 1953 Tops complete set in photo album sold for $6,000. The 1962 Tops set sold for $5,100. The 1952 Topps Gil Hodges autographed card sold for 2000 Hodges died in 1972 before the autograph craze. So to have a Gil Hodges autographed card is pretty impressive. I'm actually surprised it only sold for $2,000. Hall of Famer, 1952 Topps, autographed, very rare, 2000 What do you think that would go for today if, um, if that were to come up for auction? I couldn't find a, another example of it coming up for auction. 1957 top set, uh, $5,400. 1956 top set, $4,800. 1948 to 55 Bowman sets complete. Couldn't find how much those went for. So he split this up over multiple auctions, and it was difficult to really figure out what was from this uh, collection and what wasn't. I had a hard time in some cases, but... He also had binders and binders of 1980s minor league baseball card sets, all the minor league sets that you would want, uh, like the Cal Ripkins from before his rookie year, the Don Mattingly's, the Roger Clemens's, all those Hall of Famers, or in Clemens's case, not necessarily Hall of Fame, but Hall of Fame talent, their minor league cards. And then he had hundreds of 1990 or post-1990 baseball card sets, hundreds of them. Not a whole lot of value there in most cases, but uh, across all the different brands, he had them. So pretty amazing. What would you do if you walked into this, this room? Somebody said, oh, my husband was a collector. Why don't you come over and see what he had? And you walk in and it's just this massive floor to ceiling, bookshelves of binders of cards. I, I, I don't know, I mean, I would uh, I'd probably get Chase and Cardboard or Chris Sewell on the phone pretty quickly. Have them come out. Check it out. Let me know in comments, though, what you, what would you do? If you're new here, I do a weekly Attic Find Friday series. Oh, let me also tell you, this sold for well over $100,000 for everything. And, of course, it was on consignment, so the majority of it went to the, the widow. Uh, but I think that Chris Afuli did pretty well for himself. Um, yeah. Click that subscribe button. I do this every Friday until I run out of Attic Find stories. All right. Thanks very much for watching. Have a great weekend and happy Mother's Day.